Hey guys, today I'll be showing you something a little bit different here. I thought this would be a good opportunity to kind of go through a list of mini mode changes. And uh, I've actually, very rarely, I've got all generations just about of a mini mode here at my shop. So I thought this would be kind of a cool approach. And also I'm lining them up because I'm actually about to start on a mini mode month here. It's going to be just mini modes. I'm uh, going to be restoring them uh, one after other here and uh, knocking them out. I've already started on one of them, which you can see the back covers off of that one. Uh, Sutton's actually started the restoration process, but I just put it over here so I could kind of get a whole line of, of the Mini Moog history. Um, so what we've got is we've got a 71 Mini Moog, RE Moog Mini Moog. We've got a 72 Mini Moog, which is my personal. We've got a 75 Mini Moog, but it's really early. It's like uh, January of 75, so it's actually still built like a 74. So we got the 74, 75 Mini Moog, I'm going to call it. And then we've got a really late Mini Moog, probably around 1979, 1980, somewhere around there. It's actually the last version before they went to the Special Edition model, which was the same Mini Moog. They just put a little badge plate on it and changed the wheels back to clear wheels, which all this will make sense. So we'll start with the the really the holy grail of Mini Moogs here. This is like the the first generation, first run. This is serial number 37, so this is really early. And uh, it hadn't been restored yet, but uh, what, what you can see here is you can already see it's actually badged RE Moog, so it's a different badging. It's a metal badge. Uh, something you'll notice too is the interface is actually etched metal. It's not got any kind of plastic overlay or, or any of that kind of stuff. This is actually an etched interface uh, panel. So it's metal etched. And then uh, what we've also got that's a lot different from any other Mini Moog is you've got a whole different LHC. That stands for left hand control. So you've got the clear wheels, uh, as you can see. And instead of having the toggle switches that you would use like on a 72 Mini Moog, which you can see there, you've got the glide and decay, you've got a glide momentary button you have to hold in to make it glide. At the same time, you've got a decay button that's momentary, so you have to hold in this button to get a decay. So they were still kind of, I think, getting ideas as far as how they wanted to design it with this stage, because this later would become a, a you know latching switch, uh, like what you see with the rocker switch. So that's the early, early version of it. And a lot of times you'll see people drill holes and put a toggle because these buttons, you have to hold them in. It's kind of a nuisance. And you also don't have the foot pedal plug-ins. So you can't plug in a foot pedal to hold the decay button or glide uh, control. So kind of a, a early, you know, like I said, early approach to this. Uh, I will also be getting into circuits later. Uh, for now, I'm just going to go over the chassis design. But you can also see this beautiful wood they used, uh, really nice wood. And there's actually a story behind the Mini Moog. Now, uh, you guys can correct me if you're wrong, Moog Music may be watching this as well. Uh, maybe some of the Moog Archive stuff. Uh, but there's a guy by the name of Chad Hunt I had the privilege of talking to a few years ago, and I think he has since passed away. But he actually worked at Moog Music back in the Trumansburg days. He was actually at the little Trumansburg factory. And he was one of the engineers there, along with uh, with uh, Bill Hemsath, and uh, I think Rich Walborn was there. You can correct me if I'm wrong. I know I think Jim Scott was involved at that time as well. Uh, Bob Moog, he told me that Bob Moog was more he was working more in the R&D department, research and development, and uh, I think Bill Hemsath was chief engineer at the time, and then uh, Chad Hunt worked under uh, Bill Hemsath. Uh, interesting story, as I was told by Chad, is that Bill Hemsath actually built harpsichords on the side. And so actually all the woodwork that you see came from Bill. That was, uh, that was from the harpsichord designs. That's what I was told. Now, you guys can correct me if I'm wrong, let me know. But this is just history here. I'm just trying to uh, gather as much history as I can from what I've heard over the years on the Mini Moog. And since I've got a RE Moog serial number 37 Mini Moog, I thought this would be an appropriate time to bring this up. Um, but yeah, anyways, you can see that it's, it's built really nice. It's still got the classic Mini Moog look, but there are some chassis design changes, such as you can see that this is actually a flat panel on the side where mine actually rolls. This is 72 Mini Moog, so it actually starts getting that roll that you see on all uh, chassis. Um, 
So there would be one Mini Moog between these two, and it would be the Musonix Mini Moog, which I have actually worked on one of those. I've got a video on that one, which I'll post in the in the video description below, so you can go check that out, which belongs to Freddy. So Freddy, gonna give you a shout out on your Mini Moog here. Um, but uh, so there would be one between these two. But overall, this is this is what you got with the early early Mini Moog, and like I said, I'll be going over circuitry as well. Uh, right now, I'm just dressing just the chassis. But uh, what you can see too is you'll see that the indication of the oscillator, uh, you have more, uh, basically more numbers for the rotation of your of your oscillator. Now it doesn't affect the actual uh, the actual range. It's the same range as what you find in the later mini mugs. But what is interesting about this one, and I don't know if it's got a problem or if it's actually designed this way, but when you go into low mode, it's really slow. And this actually has the first version oscillator board. It still has the original oscillator board, which is really rare. Um, so, like I said, I've never worked on this particular model, so I don't know exactly what's normal because it's new territory for me as far as the actual oscillator design. Um, but we'll be getting in that later. So that's the 71 Mini Moog. Now we go over here to the 72 Mini Moog, and you can start seeing some changes here. You can see that the panel is plastic but it's a metal backing so this has actually still got a metal interface with a plastic overlay with the screen printing in it um, not sure how they did that uh, I think they actually just used layers and they and they printed between the layers and then would cut coat it I think that's how this worked um, and so you can start seeing that the actual controls changed from having all those numbers to what we see on later mini mocs the LHC panel is different from later Mini Moogs, though, and and you can see it's, it's it's about the same width. That one there, you can see it's a lot wider. It's got a lot wider area than this one. Um, but there's clear wheels, just like on the early Mini Moog, and you've got the decay and glide switch as well as the jacks on this particular one, which you see carry over all the way in the next generations of Mini Moogs. Um, the badging on this one is actually, this is a early Moog Music badge. So it's actually the Moog Music branding, which would have been between Musonics, Ari Moog, and then you get, or you get Ari Moog, Musonics, then Moog Music. And so this has actually got the Moog mu uh, Music badging. Once again, it's a metal badge with a plastic overlay on the front. The back badge is actually etched metal. And I've worked on a few 72 Mini Moogs now, and they're all that way. So evidently they, they put the etched metal badge on the back because they still had some, I'm guessing, and they were more, you know, uh, they, were, they were higher, um, they didn't crack, they didn't get busted like these could. So I think that's why they put them on the back. But uh, once again, you can see that chassis roll on the side, and uh, but primarily it's built very similar as far as the construction of the chassis and the wood used to what you see with the early Mini Moog. So it's a very similar design. And uh, then we go to the 70, I'm going to call this a 74 Mini Moog because it's built like a 74. So what we've got here is you'll see some things happen. Now this happened mid-74. Some 74 Mini Moogs I get in are still thin. But you'll see this this chick, the, the end chicks are actually wider. The wood is actually cut wider compared to what I've got on these early Mini Moogs. And these are actually bad about separating. It's, it's bad about pulling apart because this wood's really thin. And of course, most people didn't condition the wood so it would dry out, crack, pull away. So you have to really keep these things conditioned in the early ones. Uh, later ones, are, they're thicker. They're, uh, they, they, there's a better quality to them. And you can tell that there's a quality change to the chassis uh, around 74, mid-74. Um, they get just beefier. They get, you know, a lot... A, a lot more sturdy, but it's still the same, you know, same design overall. It's still, you still see the same qualities carry over. This one has the uh, the plastic interface, screen printed, but no back metal plating. So it's just it's just a plastic overlay. When you compare it to this one, which let me see if I can zoom in here and I'll show you. So you can see that little metal ridge that's actually. Uh, behind this uh, panel, so it's almost like they used a, p a piece of sheet metal to hold the. Uh, they actually bonded the the plastic overlay too. Where on this one, you can see it's just plastic. It's plastic all the way through, and that's what you see on the continued run of these things. Also, the the texture changes. So you've actually got like a 
a embossed leather, fake leather kind of uh, thing. Of course, I need to clean this mini mug. I haven't been, I haven't got to that part of the restoration yet. But you can see the kind of the the textured surface. Where if you look at the earlier mini mug, it's smooth. So it's 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 got a smooth texture. Um, and so that's some differences there. Overall, though, once again, you see a very similar design to what you see in the 72 as far as the layout. Uh, the LAC panel changed, and uh, there's one way you can tell. Uh, as the switches look the same, everything looks the same, but you'll notice that on this one here, they actually, it was metal with a, uh, with a wrap graphics. And so you got this white cornering here, and it's it's a little I think it's a little more narrow than what you get with this one. Or it might actually this one might be a little bit more narrow than what you get with this one. But uh, you can just see the the graphics change on this. Now in the R in the um, Musonix Mini Mode, it looks just like this. But where this one's actually got this um, like like printed overlay, it's actually etched, and this is actually exposed aluminum right here, where this one's actually white. So that's a difference. Where this one here, if you look at it, it's just painted white. It's, or, I'm sorry, just painted black. It's just a black painted uh, panel with screen printed uh, dis, uh, decals. And um, actually, this might be wrapped as well. I think it is wrapped. I take that back. It is a wrapped uh, overlay on the LHC panel, but it's just all one piece, it's all one color. So, because you still got the embossed leather look, as you can see. You can see, kind of see that texture, like the uh, like the overlay is is on there. So you'll see that this actually has clear wheels. I'm, I'm sorry, white wheels. I'm getting all confused here. You got white wheels, but they're smooth edged white wheels. Now between 72, I did find this out on one of the mini mugs I got in here, and we've I've narrowed it down to when it happened, and I've got a video on that I'll post in below as well because I can't remember the dates. But there was a time when it went from the clear wheels to a white blocky wheel made like these, but they're white and blocky. These are what I call the cream smooth wheels. You can see the edges are kind of rounded. They're not uh, real blocky like what you find on this wheel. You can see this one actually still has the sharp edges on it where this one's kind of rounded off. And uh, so it gives you a little bit better feel. And so they're... Uh, these are the white wheels, and these actually are built different. They actually started using the, the little metal pins as the stops, where the early wheels use screws. They're actually threaded into the, the plastic of the wheel. So that's a difference. But overall, everything else is, is very similar. This has got the um, Moog Music badge. Another detail of the Moog Music badge is you can see the edges are rounded on the badge. You can actually see that the edges come to a rounded corner where on the early ones they're actually sharp corner so that's another difference and this is the same basically this design here ran all the way from like 74 all the way up to 1980 or 81 or whatever the last I think 82 was the last run of mini mugs but uh, they were all the same basically um, but there was an oscillator change which I'll be bringing up later on as well so this is uh, this is a 74 mini mug, which represents pretty much 74 through uh, 1982, pretty much. Uh, but I will go over the 82 mini mug or, or later mini mug because there is something that you see happen, and it's something I don't necessarily like about mini mugs, and I don't know why Moog did it, but they did it. Uh, there's a certain air of mini mug when you see them just kind of paint these things like this brown color. <laughs> And you can see it went from like this nice looking wood, you know, looks great, looks great all the way down the line, and you get to this mini mug and it's like, what happened? It's like you painted it brown. <laughs> There's a little bit of wood, uh, wood showing through as far as the, the uh, texture of the grain, but it's very, very minimal. And we call these the honey. I call these the honey glazed mini mug because they're just, they're just kind of a, a, a flat brown. Uh, not real attractive. They, I mean, they're still a mini mug. They still sound great, but the wood just don't look as as cool as what you see in the earlier mini mugs. But it's just this flat, you know, like I say, flat brown. I don't know if my camera can can get this too well. But uh, like I say, once again, as far as design goes, very similar to that one. But this is actually the the wheels that would come in in '75, later '75. 
um, you would actually start seeing these ribbed wheels. And these ribbed wheels ran all the way up to like 1981. And then uh, they went to back to clear wheels for the special uh, special edition, the last run. And uh, so they'd have the clear wheels and then they have a, a badge on the side that said, you know, the serial number with, you know, the, the Moog history kind of run, uh, run time. Uh, but now this is serial number 13,000, so this is pretty late. I'm really kind of surprised they don't have the badges because I don't know when they started that exactly. Because uh, really, when it gets past a certain era of mini Moog, they just, I don't know, they're, they're still mini Moogs, but the early ones are more, to me personally, they're just more cool. Um, but, uh, anyways, this is the, the graphics on this one look exactly like the 74, uh, as you can see. So it's got the same graphic. Uh, same graphics. So now these switches, you'll see these switches are all discolored a little bit. They would originally been a blue color. They all kind of fade out or turn green just from sunlight or use or uh, environment. You know, that plays a big role. Uh, but you can see that everything is very similar as far as construction goes to what we have in the early seven, uh, the late, uh, the early 75 Mini Moog. Um, so it's a very similar design. Chassis still looks identical. Um, it's just the wood changed color. That's really all it is. And uh, they just used a different stain. That's really what they did. Um, and this one's had mods too, so ignore these two jacks on the side. That's actually a modification that's been done to this one at some point in its life. But uh, anyways guys, I thought you guys might appreciate this. Just a good overlook of the keyboards uh, as, as a history mark. I will be flipping these things around now, taking the back panels off, and show you what's inside and what changed between the era of Mini Moogs. So I'll be right back. Okay, I got these Mini Moogs turned around here, and I'm going to go through each one and, and kind of what changed in them. Uh, now there's some things that goes in depth, but I'm not going to go really heavily in depth. I'm just going to give you a good overview uh, because this can get really technical really fast. And uh, so I'm just going to kind of touch bases on kind of what changed and go from there. Um, but now once again, this is a early Mini Moog. You're going to see a big change between this one and the rest. This is just, it's built completely different. And uh, it's as far as the way it's laid out, I mean it's still Mini Moog. You still see the circuitry, but there's some design uh, as far as like the heat sinking on the power supply, the transform mounting, that kind of stuff is going to be way different. Uh, just because it was still, in, I would actually kind of call this a prototype. Even though it's, it's got a serial number, it's still kind of in that early stage of, of build. So what we have here, this has actually got the what I call the version 1 oscillator board. And now this is it's really rare to find the version 1 oscillator board. Uh, because even these early Mini Moogs, a lot of people would trash this board and put in a version 2 oscillator board. For a good reason. These things here did not hold tuning at all. And one of the big changes you see is that everything is discrete, meaning it's all made up of transistors and components of that nature. So you can see that we have all these transistors linked together. They're trying to do a, a thermal sink, which it doesn't really do that well. And uh, so it makes it really sensitive to temperature changes drastically. I mean, it, just go, it can go from being completely tuned, air conditioner kicks on, it goes way out. Um, and so that's that's the big problem with this board. And so they redesigned it um, in 19... Well, I don't know exactly when they redesigned it, but I know for a fact that around serial number 300 and something, they went from this board to a version 2 oscillator board, which is what you see here. Now what you'll see the difference between this oscillator board and this board is you start seeing integrated circuits. And the integrated circuits make up your, uh, your summing amplifiers as well as your exponential current conversion circuitry. Um, for those that don't know, a oscillator of this nature is actually current controlled. So what they have to do is they had to make a circuit that would convert voltage to current, which is where you get the term exponential current conversion. And so what it does, it's, it's actually a set of transistors in there that, that converts the CV input into a current that drives your FET, which also uh, it drives your FET and your timing capacitor to give you the set frequency. And then you calibrate your, your voltages to, to compensate for the changes in that circuit. That's kind of how this works. That's basically an oscillator. Um, everything else here is wave shaping. So wave shaping wise, you can see that there is some, uh, there's some differences even in the wave shaping design layout. Um, you've actually got a adjuster for your triangular wave, I believe. It's either your sawtooth or triangular wave. I have to look and see. 
um, but you actually have to adjust the waveform on this one for your for your amplification uh, where this one here you don't have that it's all fixed um, you still have your basically you have your range and scale but they're laid out different and then you got your octave which is what you see here range scale and octave so it's similar in that manner but uh, you do have an extra set of, of trims there so we've talked about the oscillator version 1 version 2 now there's a version 3 and the version 3 didn't come out till like 1979 and this is the version 3 oscillator board and what it does it's super super stable it uses a uh, UA726 thermally uh, regulated transistor pairs as the exponential current conversion and so they heat up above uh, the ambient temperature so they stay really stable and of course you got more calibration points so you got it's actually where you start seeing a high calibration like you might see some of your synthesizers we have a you know scale range and then high and this actually has that so you start seeing a lot uh, a lot more design change here what also happened is they went from having individual summing amplifiers to having one summing for all oscillators which makes it even more stable and then you actually start seeing things for for wave shape and, and integrated circuitry form so you start seeing integrated circuits making up your, your uh, wave shaping stages they went with resistor networks to save room from having all those resistors like you see in the earlier boards and uh, there's still some transistors but you see a lot less of them in this particular design um, as far as a mini mode goes that I would want to carry on stage with me this is the one this is the one I'd want to actually tour with because this would be the one that would be rock solid and not drift a whole lot at all. But with that said, you also lose some tonal characteristics because the oscillators are so precise in the calibration that it sounds thin when they actually, they, there's no phase interaction because there's no beating if you tune it, if you tune it directly to each oscillator, it'll hold it. And so actually when I calibrate these, I calibrate these off a little bit so there's a little bit of a phase between the oscillators um, just to give it a little bit more warmth. Now you can also detune it a bit on the interface using your oscillator tune controls, but you know I, I like to just do it that way. That way it's got a natural feel to it like an early mini moog. So that's your three oscillators, and that's and so this brings us up to revision one, revision two, and revision three. So if you ever hear me talk about what revision oscillator board uh, I'm talking about in my videos, now you know. You have a visual of kind of the differences. Now, the 74 Mini Moog or 75 Mini Moog, this one's already been serviced before and they replaced the trim pots with uh, multi turn, which is actually really nice. They work real well. But it's the same oscillator design that you see in 72. So this oscillator ran all the way from 1972 all the way up to like 1978, right before they went to that oscillator board. So interesting stuff. So if you have any mini mode between 72 up, you got you should have this board unless it's been updated to that board, which you could actually update them. Um, and a good way to tell if you have that oscillator board is you'll see if you look at the back panel, this one's only got two holes for the calibration points. And if you look at the late cover here, which I'm having to prop it up because it's got those jacks hooked to it, you will see four holes making that up. You'll see one hole that's drilled between the two holes that are not, uh, normally there and you got your high end compensation right there. So that's a, that's how you can actually tell just by physically looking at a Mini Moog uh, if it's got the version 2 or 3 oscillator board. Um, so there's the oscillator board covered on all units. And just to show you too, this was actually made 371. Um, and I believe that's Bill Hemsath's writing right there. 371 and then on my Mini Moog, it's actually, you'll see, uh, it was actually inspected 61072 by PR. I think that's Roger Luther there, Final Assembly RL. I think that's Roger Luther. Um, but yeah, you can see that mine was actually finished in 61072 right there. Maybe you can see it. It's a little dark right there. But it was actually, the, the Final Assembly was done 6872. So that's kind of cool. And that's what I like about these early Mini Moogs as well. There's a lot of markings in these things. So now it brings us up to the next thing uh, that's a big topic. And that's the voltage controlled filter. 
So this is the transistor ladder filter. You can actually see the transistor ladder. And once again, it's all discrete. You don't see uh, transistor ray chips like you see later on in other Moog synthesizers. The Mini Moog has this discreetly built um, uh, transistor ladder, as well as a discrete balancing circuit. So you got discrete transistors making up the balancing as well. Um, something you will see here though is you do not have the scale pot. You got the range and the and the uh, self oscillate. Uh, I think they call that regeneration on these. Um, but you have those two, but you don't have the scale, so there's no way to actually scale this oscillator. Um, and it would, I mean, you could kind of scale it, but it would never be correct because you didn't have the control of, of uh, calibrating it. Now, this design would have ran from this Mini Moog, the Musonics Mini Moog, and then in 72, like my Mini Moog, you start seeing something. You start seeing them kind of retrofit this, this pot to make the scale. So this is the 72 Mini Moog, and you can see that they, you know, still all discrete, just like the early one. But you start seeing this, this scale trim that they added so you can actually calibrate the scaling of the filters to make it track the keyboard correctly. So that's a change. That's probably the biggest change that happened uh, between this one and the 72 Mini Moog. Um, there's also you know some other stuff as far as like gain staging and that kind of stuff that that changed as well, but uh, you know it's it's, it's actually in the uh, VCA that changed a little bit. Like I said, I hadn't serviced this one at all, so you still see all these hold caps. You can see why I re why I recap these things and redo them. You can actually see these caps starting to blow out. You can see the end swelling out real bad. Uh, some of these actually started kind of lo looks like they actually started kind of leaking a little bit. But uh, anyways, that's your, your VCF board, and that's the biggest difference right there. Now this holds the VCF, the um, VCA, the uh, audio input uh, amplifier preamp, and the overload circuitry. That's what's inside this, as well as the 440 hertz. This is your 440 hertz oscillator here um, for tuning reference. But uh, that's it. Uh, that's, that's the biggest differences between this Mini Moog and then what you see change later. Once again though, you'll see changes and like I say, I, I don't know a whole lot about this mini mode because I hadn't dug into it just yet. Um, but you can see physically that there's a different build to the heat sinks of the power supply which is actually really dangerous because there's actually voltage on these heat sinks and you can see how close it's setting that transformer. In fact, it's wedged against the transformer and they've put uh, stuff between the, the heat sink to try to keep it from making contact and, and failing isolation of this this uh, design. Um, the transformer is mounted way up here as well and you can see the big old bolt sticking out which uh, I'm guessing that's factory. I don't really know. Because um, like I say this is the first early Mini Moog I've seen. But you can see the top change too. Whoops. You can see the top change as well. This is a metal plate. has a gap in it. And it's made in Trumansburg, New York, and this is the serial number, 1037. So one, they started with 1,000 serial number, so it's just you ignore the one, and it's 37. Um, but you can see the jacks and everything are still the same between the, the two instruments. Something else you'll notice, too, is the cord changes. Uh, this is a two-pronger, uh, two-prong cord. Uh, it's a pretty thick cord for a two-pronger. Um, now, something I don't have that, that, that they did was they stuck with a two-pronger all the way to 72, which mine had a two-pronger. Now, when I got mine, I didn't know that. And so I actually installed a three-pronger cord, uh, like what you find on later Mini Moogs, as you can see here. So that's, that's the kind of cord I put on it. But it would originally had a two-pronger, but it would have been like a, a lamp cord, uh, so to speak. And uh, so it would have been a little bit thinner. In fact, this is the original wire right here. You can see where I tied into it right there. So that's the difference. Um, but yeah, the power supply, you can also see the heat sink, how they changed the heat sink, changed the transformer location, moved it from way up there on that one to the middle. And then they uh, changed that up a little bit. Um, but yeah, you can see where they're playing with a lot of values and stacking components to get the right stuff to work for this. And that's actually a factory. You can actually uh, stack uh, 
certain things to get a certain frequency for adjusting your frequency of your 440 hertz etc but you can see that we're really experimenting in this particular unit where mine you start seeing it's a little bit cleaner you know you, you still still see some things stacked um, to get the frequencies in but you don't see quite the uh, the stack like for example right here um, you can look here and they've stacked components there to make this this work correctly so that's kind of interesting. That's just an interesting uh, look there. Now, what's interesting, and this is where it gets cool. So you see on this one, it has the the scale uh, that they added. Well, by 74, and this is actually what you'd find in a 74, is they actually redesigned the board to add a trim for scale. So you see actually this rheostat style uh, pot a trimmer um, for adjusting the scale. And you can see how cleaner it looks. It looks a lot cleaner, a lot better design. And then once again, you start seeing the board get even cleaner as far as how they would stack components and uh, that kind of stuff. So, and you can actually see a component change as well. You see them go from, uh, these are polystyrene caps and these are Mallory caps. These are actually like a, a film cap, like these are, but they're a different, a different grade of film cap. Um, Typically, this is actually kind of what you find in polyester caps. It's a very similar material, um, but these are exposed a little bit more than what you have with a, a, a cap, which you'll see in a minute. So we go from a uh, we go to a polystyrene cap with a a scale. Power supply doesn't change a bit. There's some components added to help with oscillations, uh, uh, parasitic oscillations, hysteresis, that kind of stuff. Um, you also see a difference in the actual uh, board here. This is your rectifier board. You can see the caps are turned different where they're turned this way on earlier units. And I had to actually mod this one for an extra cap. So that's that. And you can see the early one had only two, uh, two capacitors for filtering with your rectifiers. And this one also had only two. But they actually, actually the same caps were in mine, the Cornell Doubler. When I got it and they dried out and it started having all kind of noise and so I had to actually go through this one. I waited till last minute to really go through my own personal mini moog. Um, so that's interesting. That's that's some changes there to the to the VCF. Now there's some gain stage changes which involve some resistors, um, which I can kind of point out a little bit. This one's got some early early uh, value resistors here here and then one here I believe, and then that one's actually got. Uh, I believe it's got the same it's got this has actually got different values than what mine has so this is even different than from what I have as far as the gain staging of the amplifier so then we go to this one you see the gain stages change again um, it gets a little weaker uh, it doesn't have quite the presence that these early ones have due to some of the gain staging um, but uh, that's you know that's all physical stuff that's not like a physical board change that's just component change values basically is all that is so i'm not really going to credit those into the changes in the mini moog even though they do matter it's it's something that's just a a change to component values um then we go to the late mini moog now this is where you can see a lot of changes the board looks exactly the same as the same board but you start seeing these polyester caps and uh, this is what i was talking about earlier um, these are little polyester caps and you start seeing those being used in place of the polystyrene caps and actually these are, are more stable that's why they use these they're a lot more stable than what you have with the polystyrene or the others but polystyrene is in my opinion I like them better for some of the audio audio stuff um, but uh, you can see that you have the transistor ladder just like the other ones, it's all discrete steel. You have the uh, the scale pot still in there, and uh, you, then you also have this newer uh, rectifier board as well. Now this one hasn't been touched. I haven't serviced this one yet, so you can kind of see what it looks like before I service it. Um, power supply is, you know, that's the same. But what you also see change is you start seeing screen printing on the boards, so you can actually see what components are what. So R2, R3, R6. For just examples where this one here you have to look at what you have and you have to go look in the manual look at a, a board layout and figure out your uh, reference designation for the components so this is actually a lot cleaner to work with and it's a lot easier to service because you can just look at it and go okay well that's r2 
uh, when you're looking at schematic it makes it a lot easier but uh, that's really the main differences um, that's that's it and I just thought it would be kind of cool to go over these units and show you the differences now something I did forget to bring up is I showed you the layout on this early unit this being metal with serial number Trumansburg so now we got a 72 now mine's a little beat up because it came unglued this is actually still metal still metal overlay and you can see that it shows everything that that one shows there's no cut right here it actually flows on down you can see this it says Williamsville New York and then my serial number is 1548 so making this the 548th Minimo built and uh, once again the serial number yeah I've showed you the inside where Roger Luther I believe that's Roger Luther 6872 this one here same thing it becomes a uh, actually a piece of uh, uh, screen uh, well not screen printing but actually a piece of material that's been printed just just like a, a sticker and so it comes on down it shows everything that mine shows Williamsville New York and then it's 6768 is the show number on this one and this one actually you'll see that it no longer has the sticker it no longer has the sticker inside there but somebody has written in it and it says 129 so this is actually 129 and I think if we look up there if we can see it it actually says 120 uh, 12975 OS and 6768 uh, six, serial number and so you start seeing some some of that change it's also got a sticker down here a yellow tag which is what Moog started doing around 74 actually I think they started doing it around 73 it's far, part of the Norlin when Norlin bought Moog they started actually doing quality control stickers and so you'll see those on later mini mogs where the early ones don't have that they just have this white paper in there that shows the assembly line as it went down the line now the late ones uh, they don't have much as far as signatures go they start using QA stamps so you don't really have those personal little signatures in there it's usually just QA notes um, which I'll show you in a minute um, same thing on this one, the same material as this one as far as the layout. You can see it goes across. This one actually says Buffalo, New York now. And the serial number is 130061. 13, so it's a really late one. And you also start seeing like warning stickers and all this kind of stuff where they're talking about uh, like uh, if you look at the back panel especially you'll see like caution. Uh, you'll see all these like caution tag, uh, tags on it where they're trying to tell people not to go in there. Uh, I guess they had issues with people opening these things up and or they probably do that because of laws you know a lot of times the laws will say oh you gotta label this stuff um, something I did forget about the transformer though going back to the power transformer uh, we'll start back down here you'll see that you don't have a switch for selecting 115 volt to 40 so you actually had to use a power converter with these early mini mogs so this one doesn't have the power converter this one doesn't have the, I'm sorry the the power switch the chain voltage change switch this one doesn't have it by 74 they added it so you can see that you can actually select between 115 to 240 volts right or 230 volts 230 240 um, but you can select uh, what voltage you wanted to use so it had a a um, what we call that that's a, a dual primary winding which you can series parallel to get different voltages uh, for, for uh, input and so if you series them you get uh, 240. If you parallel them, you, you're set up for 115. Uh, that's kind of how that works with these transformers. So that's really the design change. You also see a change in the transformer design itself. You go from a, a open open winding with just paper wrap to a closed transformer, which is actually a solid. It's closed on the ends, so you don't have to worry about like the windings coming out or damages having to the transformer. So that's another design change. But once again, you see, you can see clearly that after you know around 72, you start seeing the exact identical kind of builds going on as far as what you got as a mini moog. And uh, so that's kind of how it works. Now the keyboard circuitry, I hadn't even talked about the keyboard circuitry. It's the board back here. Um, I don't really think they changed that much. I think there's a few components that changed. Uh, the biggest issue mini mogs all mini mogs have is they have circuit bleed through uh, caused by humidity changes uh, some of them are better than others some really are really good I've had in here some are really bad and uh, they actually it was so bad at one point they wrote it in the manual to lift components off the board and, and just run flying leads to the components to keep them from from drifting out 
Um, for those that don't know, the keyboard circuit is, is what we call a sample and hold circuit. And all it is, basically, it's a capacitor with a FET, or transistor. And when you hit a key, the gate of the key turns on the transistor, allowing the CV rail voltage come in, charge the cap. When you let off the key, the FET opens, and that cap is supposed to hold that, that uh, voltage that your key was at. And then there's a reference on the outside for the oscillators to hold that frequency at that cap charge. And so anytime you hit a key, it's supposed to recharge that cap and hold that value of whatever uh, voltage you have. And what happens is a lot of times with these things is you'll, you'll charge it up, the FET will open, FET's working fine, but the board itself has contamination in it and it causes that cap to actually leak. So the cap will start leaking off and you'll start hearing this drift in frequency. It'll just slowly go out and you have to re-trigger a note and it'll charge it back up for a while and then it'll start drifting back out. So that's actually an issue that you see with a lot of these Moogs. Not just mini Moogs, that's pretty much all these early uh, synthesizers. Uh, not too many of them I know of it will actually hold, uh, can, you know, hold the sample memory for a long period of time for that reason. It's really analog, really analog stuff. Um, but anyways guys, I hope y'all found this interesting. I thought this would just be a really cool time to show off these mini Moogs, kind of give you a good history of, of the differences in the mini Moog. And, uh, you know, just give you a good overview of, of different stuff. Um, you know, something I did forget to go over is the back panel. So you don't see any Moog badge here. You see the metal badge I was talking about earlier, the etched Moog badge, which you can actually see it's etched. It's, it's actually reflective. Um, it's not painted white. That's actually the metal. Um, I've actually polished this one, so it's a little better than, than most. And then, once again, you go here and you've got the uh, the rounded edges uh, badges like on the front and then same thing here identical to this mini Moog so that's one change also on the early panel uh, this is what's going to be a headache when I get to this one is there's no trim pots <laughs> you can't you can't actually access the oscillator trims from outside the chassis there's no holes to calibrate except for the octave which is kind of interesting uh, which on this panel you see they put those holes so um, it's really interesting there also this panel is really blocky you can see once again this one actually has this this hard corner where mine's rounded and this actually went on all the way up now my panel looks rough because I cleaned it and I used a chemical this was early days when I started out and I always tested stuff on my instruments and it kind of got a little oxidized look to it um, tried to clean it up I haven't been able to clean it up so I don't know what I did there but uh, anyways guys that was the last thing I want to bring up I forgot about um, overall though you can see that they're pretty much identical and uh, as far as the way they actually built the chassis once again here's a good example of that thin that thin piece versus the large chick and you can see that they actually had to add extra support of course they added support in all of them uh, you can see that they, they use them there too but these early ones they were real bad about separating, like I say, because this was just so thin, and it was a it was basically it was routed out in there to fit over this, and then I would glue it, and uh, and so it just it's it's a lot it's a lot more fragile than what you get with this big beefy beefy side panel. So for that reason, this is actually a, a lot better series mini mode as far as actually touring or you know having to use this thing in a in a in a live situation. But uh, anyways, guys, thanks for watching. If you have any questions or if you have any more comments or something I might have missed, you know, please put it in the comments and uh, and uh, I'll make sure I read them and, uh, you know, respond to them here. But I appreciate you watching and uh, y'all take care. So one last thing, I got editing the video and I realized I left out something. And that is I forgot to bring up the buffer board. Uh, the buffer board was added around 1973. And what it does, and the way you can actually tell, and I brought this up before, and I know some of you already know this, is that there's two screws you'll see right here in the chassis. And what that holds, it holds a little circuit board, and it has three uh, buffering amplifiers on it. And they tie into your, your rain switches to keep load uh, changes from affecting each oscillator. So, for example, on early mini Moogs, like for example, my mini Moog, I don't have it. So if I change my oscillator, Tuning, sometimes it affects oscillator 1's tuning because what they do, they use one set of resistors for the uh, division 
And so anytime you change the pot, you're actually changing load in that resistor. And so it causes current sag. And so what those uh, buffer board does is it, is it actually prevents that current sag from happening. And keeps it at a stable, uh, stable current so you don't have the interaction. And it makes a lot more pliable. It makes a lot, you know, a lot more stable as far as like when you go from 32 to 2, you don't have any issues with the other oscillators going out. And um, it's it's a really nice upgrade. I just hadn't done it to mine because um, honestly, everybody else is more important. So my mini Moog, I've just kind of done the maintenance to it, but uh, you know, I, there's some things I would like to go back and do and add. I'd like to add that to mine, which I do add those. Um, and it makes a world of difference to how that thing interacts. Mine's not horrible. Some mini Moogs are better than others without the buffer. Some mini Moogs are horrible without the buffer. And uh, so it's something I do add to, to mini Moogs now. But you'll see that my early one doesn't have it, 72 doesn't have it, and of course this one does not have it either. So just wanted to bring that up and uh, address that before I finished editing the video here. But uh, guys, thanks for watching. Take care.